last time. All right, well, last time we proved the five lemma. Right, and so although we proved something more precise, the way you usually use this is that if, uh, if these arrows are isomorphisms, the rows are exact, and the diagram commutes, then this one is also an isomorphism. Right, and we use that to see that if you have a space with a delta complex structure and you compute the, the homology groups using that delta complex structure, then you get the same groups that you do using just singular uh, chains. Um, here's an easy corollary, again using the five lemma. Uh, let's say that A is a sub delta complex. Right, so A is a subspace, and the delta complex structure of X restricts to a delta complex structure on A. Then, well, you have a long exact sequence in the delta complex structure uh, homology, so the simplicial homology. <coughs> and you have the long exact sequence of the pair in singular homology. The inclusion of the chain complexes gives you maps like so. And since we've proved last time that this is an isomorphism and this is an isomorphism, right? then the remaining arrows have to be isomorphisms by the five lemma. Right? So by the five lemma. So that's an example of how the typical use of the five lemma. Okay. So that's what we did last time. Questions on last time? Yes? Uh, more of a comment, but the, the top row is all simple. That, oh, thank you. Yes. Thanks. More questions? I have like a logistical question. Sure. Um, so are we going to have a like practice midterm over Yes, yes. So hopefully tomorrow I'll have a chance to write a practice midterm and I'll put that up. And will there be any assignments due before the midterm? No. Okay. Yes. This is a non-logistical question. Uh-huh. Um so what happens to this chain or this this long exact sequence or this pair of long exact sequences? On the low end, when we're looking at zero, and then something just goes to the, the zero group. In other words, do we still get enough structure there for the five lemma to apply to like H oh, sure. of x? Yeah, yeah. So I mean, one uh, another way where you use the five lemma is uh, if you have zeros. You know, if if you were looking at, um, let's say, just here. No, not x, uh, x and a. Um, right, and so we have this, and then we have zeros. So we want to show that this arrow is um, an isomorphism. So we have this one, and then we have the one before it. Well, you can put a trivial arrow between zeros, and then you can continue this with zeros, 
and put another trivial arrow. Okay. And so these are obviously isomorphisms, so that one is. Got yeah. It. Yes, very good. More questions? OK, so uh, wonderful. So this isomorphism, then uh, if you think way back to when we started talking about singular homology, uh, we noticed that there are obvious uh, pros and cons for each one. For example, it's obvious that this one is a homeomorphism invariant. So now we know this one is two. Right? And it's, um, it's obvious that if you have a, a delta complex structure with um, uh, finitely many simplices in a given degree, then this is a finitely generated abelian group. And hence, this one is two. So um, speaking of finitely generated um, groups, let's give this a name. If the rank <coughs> of HNx is finite, we call it the nth Betty number. of x. And if you think way back to the first class, we talked about how Betty was one of the, uh, the um, people who made progress in topology between Riemann and uh, Poincaré. Um, great. So, and actually while I'm at it, so uh, also the, the rank of an abelian group, as you know, um, so the rank of this, uh, one way to think about it is that it's the dimension over the rationals if you take this and tensor with the rationals. Right? So you just get rid of all of the torsion and just look at how many copies of z you have here, which become how many copies of q do you have over here. Um, and we mentioned the Euler characteristic the first day. Uh, so let me go ahead and define it. This is the sum, the alternating sum, of um, uh, the Betty number. So let's, let's call this beta n of x. It is. So this is known as the Euler characteristic. And from what we've shown, it is um, a homotopy invariant, right? Because the <coughs> singular homology groups are homotopy invariants. And if um, to connect this back to how you might have seen the other characteristic before, let's say that we have a um, if x is uh, a, a polyhedron. Um, so you know, delta zero of x. The vertices, delta 1 of x, are the edges. Delta 2 of x, the faces. And of course, I mean the free abelian group on the vertices, free abelian group on the edges, free abelian group on the faces. Then, um, and these are finite. You can show that um, the um, Euler characteristic, so once you pass the homology, you get the same Euler characteristic as, uh, as before you do. So um, in this case, this would be the number of vertices minus the number of edges plus the number of faces. And if you've seen the other characteristic in, in other courses, this is probably how you saw it. Yes? When you write uh, dim sub q, what does that mean? Uh, this is a vector space over the rational numbers. And so I mean it's dimension. <coughs> OK. Great. So. Um, let's see some applications. Yes? So presumably the Euler characteristic is only guaranteed to be well-defined for spaces with finitely many homology groups? Uh, yeah. So I mean, we're defining it like this when this makes sense. I guess right? finitely so, many non-trivial homology Right, and, and finitely generated. Right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So whenever this makes sense, if these numbers are all finite and there's only finitely many of them, then this is the other characteristic. Yes? Can you say again what we mean by the rank of HNX? 
Sure, this is what I mean. So, so HN of X is always an abelian group, right? So you can all, if it's finitely generated, I can always write it as C raised to some power times, and then you know, C to the P1 to some power uh, L1, C P2, L2, C P uh, M. Right, so every finally generated abelian group can be written as a product of cyclic groups. Right? So the rank is just this k. So how many copies of z do you have? Sure. The, these guys <coughs> are known as the torsion coefficients. So they're also homotopy invariant. <coughs> Excuse me. Yes? This tensor? Um, sure, this is a, a change of coefficients. So um, I have two rings, and I can tensor them together and get another ring. Uh, I can tell you very precisely what it means here. If this is what HNx is, then HNx tensored with Q is Q to the K. OK, so when you tensor with Q, you allow multiplication by uh, rationals. And if you have something that's a finite order, then uh, I can always multiply it by you know, 1, which I write as P1 over P1. And then I move one of the P1s over, and I kill it. So if I tensor with Q, I kill everything with finite order. Okay, But in any case, don't worry about it, because we're not going to use tensor powers very much at all. So if you like, it's just this. You just take the, the free part uh, the, of, of uh, characteristic 0 and turn it into a field. OK, great. So uh, if you recall, one of our applications uh, with um, the fundamental group was to show that the sphere was um, different from the circle and different from, well, the circle was different from the sphere and different from spheres of arbitrary order, right, up to homotopy. So, well, now that we have homology, we can do this uh, more generally, right? So, for example, um, we know that uh, Hn of Sm, let's put a tilde, this is z if n is equal to m and zero else. So, uh, Sn homotopic to Sm if and only if n is equal to m. <clears throat> if you have, um, say, Rn, so if R, so here, if Rn is homeomorphic to Rm, then n is equal to m. So notice, of course, here I can't put homotopic because, of course, they're all contractible. So they are homotopic, right? But they're not homeomorphic to each other, right? And so, um, well, <coughs> if they would, if they were homeomorphic to each other, then um, R n minus a point would be homeomorphic to R m minus a point, right? So you have a homeomorphism. You restrict it here, you, you end up here. Uh, but these are homotopic uh, to s n minus 1 and s n minus 1. And hence, n is equal to m. Right. Uh, more generally, we have uh, a fact that's called invariance of dimension. Right, which this is the, the first instance, but this works more generally for manifolds. So I've mentioned manifolds before. Um, let me remind you, um, an, an n-dimensional manifold is a, a topological space 
um, which is Hausdorff, uh, second countable, so um, its topology has a countable basis. And it is locally homeomorphic. To Rn. Okay, so of course, a uh, typical example, like if you have a torus, then near each point you have a neighborhood that looks just like a neighborhood of the origin in the plane. Right? It's homeomorphic to an uh, a um, neighborhood of the origin in the plane. Right? So it's just like when you're on the, on the Earth, if you don't think too much about it, you could think that it's flat, because when you look around, it looks flat. Um, OK, so um, here's an interesting, for, for any space, not necessarily a manifold. Um, The local homology at a point is the homology of x uh, of the pair x and x minus a point. That point, uh, that same point. If you have a manifold. So let's say an n-manifold to mean an n-dimensional manifold, then uh, the local homology, uh, let's, let's use hk, I can use excision to write this as hn, where uh, here p is a point in m and u is a neighborhood of P homeomorphic to, uh, say, a neighborhood of uh, zero in Rn. Yes? What do you mean by local homology? The definition. The local homology is this. Yes. Uh -huh. OK, but since u is homeomorphic to a neighborhood of 0 in Rn, I can think of u as being a neighborhood of 0 in Rn. And then I could use uh, excision again to get that this is uh, Hn, uh, Hk of Rn, Rn minus a point. <coughs> Right? Okay, but Rn is contractible, so this is easy to compute by the long exact sequence of a pair, right? So um, in the long exact sequence of Rn, Rn minus the, or the origin, uh, you would have uh, Hn of Rn mapping to Hn, Rn minus point mapping to Hn of, of the pair. Wait, no, no, no. Hn of mapping to Hn minus 1. They probably should. Thank you. So, 
So because this is contract, and let's put tildes. Because this is contractible, these are always zero. And Rn minus a point is uh, the sphere, is homotopic to the sphere. So this is Sn minus 1. So Hk tilde, well, I don't need a tilde here, <coughs> is equal to Sure. So uh, this is a pair. So it, it has a long exact sequence in homology. right? Uh, Rn is contractible. So its homology groups are just 0. And, um, and then Rn minus a point is homotopic to the sphere. right? Rn take away the origin. That's just a sphere. OK, so for any manifold, the local homology is given by Z if k is equal to n and 0 else. So we conclude there invariance of dimension if uh, M and N are homeomorphic manifolds, then the dimension of M is equal to dimension of N. Invariance of dimension. Yeah. Yes? So is the, um, the local homology of the manifold at some point on the manifold, that's looking at k-dimensional holes in the manifold? Oh, so, so by, um, by um, excision, it's looking at what does the manifold look like near the point. So it's, it's checking. So on a manifold, you always locally look like Rn. And local homology is local. So it, it, it only sees what's going on near the point. And so it's like being in Rn. So if you like, local homology is going to detect singularities for you of a space. If you have a space that looks like uh, manifold pieces, but the pieces have different dimension, for example, if you have a, a space with singularities, like conic singularities or, or a wedge, you could think of a whole family of conic singularities, then the local homology of that space would tell you where something had changed, right? where it stopped looking locally like Rn, and now it looks locally like Rk, or something like that. So why do we get as our conclusion you know, in this theorem, why do we require M and M to be homeomorphic and not just homotopy equivalents? Right. So for example, um, if you think of Rn and Rm, they're both homotopic to a point. Right. But I guess what I'm asking is where does this proof require it to specifically be a homeomorphism? Um, well, so if, um, if our map were uh, take Rn and map it all to a point, then when I subtract a point from the left-hand side, uh, I, I get nothing on the right-hand side. Right? If you look at our proof for, for oh, R, okay. Rn to so, Rm, we had this map, and um, it, it restricted to a map once we had removed points. Right? But that won't work if, uh, if you're just projecting to a single point. So homology itself is invariant under homotopy equivalents, but the operation of removing a point isn't. That's right. And that's the key. OK. Yeah. OK. 
Uh, this was proven originally by uh, Brower, uh, our good friend who, um, who did a lot of things in topology and then decided that it was all wrong because he used the, uh, the uh, law of excluded middle. Uh, and, um, and, and they, they didn't really understand manifolds back then, but, uh, but for him it was all about open subsets of uh, Euclidean spaces and the fact that the dimension of what Euclidean space you were in was a topological invariant uh, was a big deal. Because right, it's really hard to prove this directly if you don't use homology or something like that. Uh, however, it wasn't homology that he used. <clears throat> right. He used the degree of a map. <clears throat> OK, so um, let's look at SN. Um, <clears throat> Well, let's say it like this. To every okay, so to to every map between spheres of the same dimension, we're going to assign an integer called the degree of the map, and the way we do this is um, we know that f induces a map between the the homologies. And uh, these are both the integers. Right. Every map, every homomorphism between the integers and the integers is given by multiplication by an integer. Right? That integer is the degree. So, um, so hn f of 1 is equal to some integer times 1. <clears throat> Isn't it? Yes. This hn of f is the same as f star. F, f star, yeah, f star, just restricted to the nth. Um, Wait, for what is that? One? I'm getting confused about what you're on the last one. Yeah, so you, you have the integers. Yeah. So take one, mm -hmm. the integer one, and see where you map it to. You okay. map it to a multiple of one, right? <coughs> that is the degree, that multiple is the degree. So you might worry that. Um, um, how do I know which one is one, right? Because uh, the integers have two generators, one and minus one. So how do you know whether you got a multiple of one or a multiple of minus one, right? So that means that you'd really like to have uh, a choice of generator for um, the uh, homology of the sphere. And um, we do because um, as we saw right over there, but we had seen before, We can write the um, nth, let's go ahead and put a tilde, um, homology group of sphere as the nth homology of, that's not what I mean, of the nth simplex relative to its boundary. Right? And we have a preferred generator. Right? Uh, so recall this is generated. by the identity map. <clears throat> OK. So, so we have a preferred generator, and that's what we use to talk about um, this. So you compare uh, the image that you get uh, by mapping that generator to the generator itself. And that's how you get this integer. Right? Yeah. So really, this just means we're picking an orientation on Rn. But we're picking the usual orientation. So you're putting this in Rn plus 1 with the usual orientation and choosing the generator there. And so if, if this map preserves orientation, this will be a positive integer. And if this map reverses orientation, this will be a negative integer. Okay. 
OK, so there are several obvious properties of degree. Uh, and then there are some non-obvious properties. So let's list these. So first, the degree of the identity map is equal to 1. Right, because of course the identity just induces the identity. So, so in short, can we say that the uh, the degree is uh, first off the sign is determined by whether or not it switches orientation, and then the absolute value is if we take a look at this map, the index of the image. We'll get to that, but okay. sort of, yeah. So. Almost everywhere, yes. Well, I mean, if but you, if we'll, you, we'll get there. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so another obvious property is that if f is not surjective, then the degree of f is equal to zero. Right? So why is that? Um, If you can pick a point uh, that's not in the image, then um, then f factors through. Um, so I have S n, and f actually maps this to uh, S n minus this point, and then I can map that down to S n. So if I look at this in homology, well, let's go ahead and put in. So I have here the, the inclusion, and uh, no, I have here f, and here the inclusion, and here f. Right? So if there's some point that's not in the image, then f actually maps Sn to Sn minus that point. Right? And the map from Sn to Sn factors through mapping to Sn minus that point and then including it to Sn. Right, so this is a commutative diagram. And uh, so this is z, this is z. But this, if you take the sphere and remove a point, then of course it's contractible to, say, the, the opposite point. Right? So this is 0. Let's put a tilde, and then I don't need to put any special cases. Right? So f star factors through the 0 map. So it must be 0. OK. Next, um, if f is homotopic to g, then the degree of f is equal to the degree of g. Okay. Uh, it turns out, um, and we'll prove next semester, that uh, the opposite is true as well. Um, this is an if and only if. Uh, it's a theorem of Hoff. Right. So what this says is uh, what Hoff's theorem really says in, in today's language is that pi n of s n, right? so the homotopy classes of maps from this n sphere to itself with a, a base point, um, is the integers. And uh, you assign to each homotopy class of maps, you assign the degree of any representative. Right? It's well defined because homotopic maps give you the same degree. Yes? I know we're so they were properties, but when we're done doing properties, could we look at an example maybe of Yes, definitely. So um, uh, let's go ahead and look at an example. So if you're going from S1 to S1, right? So view S1 is sitting inside the complex numbers and, um, and look at the map C goes to C to the K. OK? So once we develop more theory, we'll be able to show that the degree of this map 
is k. Right? So you should think of the degree as telling you how many times you wrap around. Right? So very clearly here in the case of S1, but it turns out also true for um, other spheres. We're really looking at how many times does this map wrap the sphere around the sphere when you take orientation into account. So go ahead. Is there any like non-trivial map that we do have the tools to compute the degree for now? Because you're saying we're going to well, see this later. Later today. Degrees. So oh, okay. well, yeah, once I finish the properties, then we'll, we'll talk about how you actually compute it. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was going to Okay. Yeah. But this, this is the intuition you should have. Okay. That it's just how many times are you wrapping around, okay. taking orientation into account. So this has degree k for, for any integer. So if you have c to the minus 2, you get degree minus 2. Can we, uh, can we extend that example? Yes. So also, if we get time, if we have time, we'll do it today. OK, so the next property is that the degree of a composition is equal to the product of the degrees. Okay. And so this is just because the induced map from the composition is the composition of the induced maps. Right. So when you're acting on the integers, g star multiplies it by the degree of g, and then f star multiplies by the degree of f. So the composition multiplied by the product of the degrees. OK. Suppose f is, um, uh, well, so let's put the sphere in Rn. So take Sn and put it inside Rn plus 1. So think of yeah. think of the plane cutting it through, through an equator. And uh, if f is reflection, across a plane, through the center of the sphere, then the degree of f is going to be minus 1. So in this case, um, we have uh, the coordinates, uh, say, x0 to xn. And we're just mapping. All that f does is change the sign of xn. So without loss of generality, let's say that you're just changing the last coordinate, so reflection in the last coordinate. OK. So. Here's how we're going to do this. Think about the, the case of the circle. Uh, we have a map that just uh, flips the, the y coordinate, right? And we want to know what this does to homology. So, one way of seeing what it does to homology is put a delta complex structure that has uh, this uh, dose as the vertices, and then you have the upper interval and the lower interval. So uh, your, um, um, right, and, and same thing over here, uh, in, in for higher dimensions, the make this u and this l. And these can be the images of, uh, of n, n simplices for Sn. So uh, Sn has a delta complex structure. with two um, n simplices, u and l. And hn of sn is uh, generated by u minus l. 
right, the way I've drawn it. Uh, L minus U, the way I drew it. Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's put the arrows going that way so that it's true. But uh, f, um, f star uh, of u minus l is l minus u. Or if you like f, f sharp. That's what it's doing at the, at the chain level. So, so the degree of f is equal to minus 1. Okay, so there's a, a, a non-trivial degree. Uh, we can use um, this computation and the previous property. See, uh, let A be the antipodal map. Degree of A is equal to minus 1 to the n plus 1. Uh, yep, plus 1. Right. And that's because uh, A, um, in coordinates like these, we take x0 to xn and give you minus x0 minus x1 minus xn. So it's just the, the composition of n plus 1 reflections. Where you just reflect in every coordinate. Okay, so an easy consequence is that if um, if n is even then the antipodal map is not homotopic to the identity map, right? Because they have different degrees. This has degree minus 1, and this has degree 1. F has no fixed points, right? I F F for x for every x. Then the degree of F is equal to minus one to the n plus one. So just take um, f sub t of x to be 1 minus t f of x minus tx. Right? This is never equal to 0. And if I divide by its If I divide by its length, then it always maps into the sphere. So it goes from the sphere to itself. And it's a homotopy between if, uh, if t is equal to 0, you get f. And if t is equal to 1, hold on, I have a sign wrong, don't I? No, if t is equal to 1, you get minus x, which is the antipodal map. And so this is a homotopy. between f and a. So they have the same degree. We get as a consequence of this that any map on an even dimensional sphere homotopic to the 
identity map has to have a fixed point. We do. Okay, so <clears throat> let's look at the consequence for vector fields on Sn. Okay, so Sn is an n-dimensional manifold, but it, of course, it's better than that. It's a smooth manifold, right? It doesn't just have um, neighborhoods that are homeomorphic to neighborhoods um, in Rn. Uh, when you look at uh, what are called transition maps, so what happens when you go from one of these um, neighborhoods to another one of these neighborhoods, the transition maps are, are, are smooth. So that means that it makes sense to talk about smooth functions, and if you can talk about smooth functions, you can talk about their derivatives. So their derivatives um, give you uh, vector fields. So um, a vector field, so let, let's, we can be very explicit here. So, uh, Sn sits inside Rn plus 1. And the tangent space at a point x in Sn is all of the vectors in Rn plus 1 that are um, orthogonal to x. Right? So you have the sphere sitting inside Rn plus 1. At every point, you have a tangent plane in this case. Right, in the case of S2. And that tangent plane just has as a normal vector the, uh, the vector, the position vector of that point. Right, so these are, it's always orthogonal. Right? And that, of course, is because um, the, the sphere is just all of the points such that x dot x is equal to 1. So if I take a derivative, then I get uh, x dot uh, x dot plus x dot is equal to zero. So that's two x times x dot equal to zero. So x and x dot are orthogonal. So anyway, as as you saw in calculus, the the tangent plane to the sphere is just the orthogonal vectors to that point. <coughs> so a vector field is just the um, uh, any function a vector field uh, to well we can go ahead and say r n plus one um, but I really want uh, I really want v of x to be in t x s n so what I want is that v of x dot x is equal to zero. Yeah, so I'm just reminding you why, why the tangent vectors to the sphere are orthogonal to the position. And that's because the sphere is defined by x dot x equal to 1, right, with the usual dot product, right? Um, and if you just differentiate both sides, okay. then by the Leibniz rule on the left, you get this, right? But that just tells you that x is orthogonal to x dot. Okay. So it's equivalent to saying that any line through the origin is normal to the sphere. That's right. Where it intersects, yeah. And sorry, what is the notation with the dot on top of the x? Oh, the tangent vector. Oh, okay, okay, yeah. okay. So just a derivative. Okay, so that's what a vector field is. So what do these look like? So for example, when n is equal to 1, then you have the circle. And at every point, well, you have the tangent line in this case, so I just have to pick a vector on this tangent line. So for example, I can just have something that's going around this way. Right, that's what a vector field would look like if you're going that way. On the sphere, <clears throat> well, you could imagine that um, you know, uh, the wind is flowing to the east, uh, directly east everywhere. So 
it's going to have to vanish at the at the North Pole for that to make sense, for it to be continuous. And also at the South Pole. All right, so if you, if you think of something that's flowing always east, then of course when you get to the North Pole, there's no good choice for where to go, so it, it needs to vanish. It's going to be continuous. Right? Uh, you could also imagine something uh, more interesting, like you have uh, a point here, and you have things flowing uh, away from that point. So think of flow lines like this, and then similarly coming down here. Of course, if I could draw, they would not intersect. Wait, so what are these supposed to be? Oh, this is just um, which way okay. things are flowing. So we have this point where uh, it vanishes. And then near this point, things are flowing away uh, in circles like this. Okay. Uh, so you know, vector field. So we talk about this in calculus, right? Um, what does this have to do with degree? Well, here's a theorem. If, um, if Sn has a vector field that never vanishes, then n is odd. OK? So in those pictures, in the case of n equals 1, we have a vector field that never vanishes, right? It just says, keep going uh, forward. Right, but uh, when we got to n equals 2, both of the examples I drew have uh, places where it vanishes. Right, The first one vanishes at the north and south pole, and the other one vanishes at that point in the center. Uh, so that's not um, just lack of creativity on my part. Uh, in, uh, in even dimensions, any vector field has to vanish somewhere. OK. <clears throat> so given our vector field is a map from Sn to Rn plus 1, if it's never 0, let V tilde of x be V of x normalized to have length 1. So now V tilde is going from Sn to Sn. So consider the following homotopy. So let's do uh, cosine of pi t x plus sine tilde of x. So here um, f t takes points on s n to points on s n, right? Because uh, cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. And um, well, because cosine squared and sine squared is equal to 1, and x is orthogonal to v tilde of x, so that I only need to check the coefficients. Uh, so f0 is um, cosine of 0 is equal to 1, sine of 0 is 0. So this is x, and f1 of x is equal to the tilde of x. Um, yes? So shouldn't the coefficients be pi over 2 then? When I put 1, sine of pi over 2. Pi over 2 would work better, wouldn't it? Uh, or 2 pi. No, 2 pi would not work. Pi over 2? <clears throat> Also, um, are we requiring a vector field to be continuous as part of the definition? Yes. 
Okay. Yeah, smooth even if you like. But yes, thank you. So let's put pi over 2 so that indeed uh, at 1 we get v tilde of x. So, uh, well, here we have a map from um, uh, part, of SN, part of Rn plus 1 to Rn plus 1, right? So smooth means that you can extend this to some open set, and, and then you get a map from Rn plus 1 to Rn plus 1, and that that is smooth, right? So yeah, smooth on a, on a closed set always means that, you can, that there is some open neighborhood, and you have a smooth function from that neighborhood that you've restricted to your closed set. I don't think I know what smooth function means. Sure. So if you have a map from Rn to Rn, then in local coordinates, uh, local coordinates, in coordinates, uh, you just have maps from R n to R. Okay. Right? And smooth means that you can take all the derivatives you like. Okay. Okay. Right? C infinity. Yeah. Yeah. So by smooth, I always mean C infinity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So the degree of v tilde of x is equal to the degree of uh, one of the identity. Uh, hold on, F1, uh, yeah, so, okay, hold on. So let's keep going with this homotopy. Um, so, okay, well now we've put pi over 2, so that's V tilde. So if we put F of 2, uh, then um, when I get pi, uh, cosine is minus 1 and sine is 0. So this is minus x, the antipodal map. Is f a homotopy? f is a homotopy. But it's one more than just? Well, it is because I changed this. Really, I should have kept it here. Uh, okay. Yeah. There we go. The point was that I needed to keep going all the way to uh, to one to get the antipodal map, right? Um, okay. Right, because really the 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 punchline isn't what happened to v tilde. The punchline is that the identity map and the antipodal map are homotopic, right? So one, which is the degree of the identity map, is equal to the degree of the antipodal map, which is minus one to the n plus one. So n has to be odd. Does the converse hold? That is to say, if n is odd, can we find a vector field that never vanishes? Yes, we can write it down. So if n is odd, then um, Uh, this uh, maps to uh, minus x1, x0, minus x3, uh, x2, minus xn, xn minus 1. <clears throat> Restricts to sn, sn, um, and nowhere vanishing. Not So there it is. Yes? So does this generalize to things other than spheres? It does, but, um, but not immediately. So if I, give you, um, if I give you any map between manifolds of the same dimension, then there is a degree assigned to that map. But it's not obtained by um, by looking at the top homology group of the manifolds, because those might not just be Z. Um, instead, you do something which we're going to do very soon. So I have one more property to show, and then we'll figure out how to do how to define this degree in general. And presumably, this theorem doesn't extend to arbitrary manifolds, because, for instance, on a torus, which is a two-manifold, you can get a vector field that never vanishes pretty easily. That's right. 
That's right. It, so it, it turns out there is a generalization that, um, that does extend. And um, yeah, in fact, even if I don't have time today, next class, I'll talk about it. Uh, as a digression, because we're not going to prove anything. Um, OK, so uh, here's a property. If, um, if you have a group and it acts on Sn freely, uh, so remember that means um, um, every G and G acts, uh, well, uh, d defines a homeomorphism. That's what it means to have an action, and um, well, and uh, product goes to composition. And that it's free uh, is that if g of a point is equal to a point, then g is the identity. For some. OK, so that's what we mean by g acts on Sn freely. And n is even, then g is very limited. It is a subgroup of C2. There are not. OK, so. Why is that? Well, uh, G has an action, so we have a map from G to the homeomorphisms of Sn. Right, that's our action. And then to every homeomorphism, we can assign the degree Okay, the degree of a homeomorphism is always plus or minus one. So I wonder if I was supposed to have said that. Um, okay, well, how do we know that? Well, a homeomorphism has an inverse. So you have to map into the invertible elements of the integers. And the invertible elements are just plus and minus 1. right? But I think I probably should have mentioned this when we talked about how uh, the degree of a composition is the product of the degrees, that any homotopy equivalence would have to have degree plus or minus 1, just because it has an inverse. OK. So uh, G maps into there. And um, if. Um, Uh, since the action is free, uh, the degree of g. So remember, we showed that if um, if g does not, if any map doesn't have uh, a fixed point, then it has the same degree as the antipodal map, right? So if g is not the identity of g, then the degree of g has to be the same as the degree of the antipodal map, since there are no fixed points. Right? The degree of the antipodal map is minus 1 to the n plus 1, but since n is even, this is minus 1. So if g is not, if little g is not equal to the identity, then this map uh, which is composition of homomorphisms, maps to minus 1. 
right? So that means that this map is uh, injective because the only thing that goes to the, the um, identity is the identity. Okay. So call this map phi. Yes, so one of the properties we proved was that if you have uh, a map between spheres that doesn't have any fixed points, then it has the same degree as the antipodal map, right? Because we could just write down a homotopy between it and the antipodal map. And, um, and the, acting freely means precisely that you don't have any fixed points. Okay. Right? Okay. So it doesn't have any fixed points, so it has this degree, minus one. Right? So phi is injective. Right, so if phi is injective, then it's an isomorphism onto its image. Why does that show that phi is injective? Because uh, remember, for a homomorphism, we just have to see uh, what elements get sent to the identity. Right? And this shows that the only element that gets sent to the identity is the identity. Okay. So how do we compute the degree in practice, right? So unless you're able to homotop it to uh, the identity or the antipodal map, or it's a reflection, then um, we don't have any way of computing it. Uh, but the degree actually is something that's very computable. Um, so here's what we compute. In practice, um, we uh, compute the degree. By first finding y in Sn such that f inverse of y is finite. So, OK, so let's set aside for a moment why can you find such a point. And let's just say that we, we, we were handed such a point, and then we want to compute the degree. So since Sn is a manifold, I know that every point has a neighborhood that looks like a neighborhood of the origin in Rn. Right? So pick neighborhoods. So pick neighborhoods B of y and ui of xi so that the, with the ui uh, disjoint, well, let's say ui to j is equal to empty set of i sub j. And um, all homeomorphic to some neighborhood f0 so on rn, and such that f sends uh, ui into v. Right, so I'm not asking for homeomorphism, just it lands inside V. Okay. So you can always do this because um, being a local homeomorphism means that if you give me any neighborhood of a point, I can find some smaller neighborhood that is homeomorphic to an open subset of uh, Rn. Right. So, um, um, well, in, in some neighborhood. We can even choose these to be uh, you know, a ball around the origin of whatever size you like, some small enough size. So are we doing this for every point y? Uh, well, no, we have some point y that has this property. OK, and after this, we're going to figure out why there is some y? Or 
Well, uh, yes. So I'm going to wave my hands because uh, the reason is uh, if things are smooth, then you, you can always find these points. In fact, almost every point will work. Uh, but it is, it is a property of smoothness. And so it's unfortunately beyond the scope of the course. OK. Um, OK, but let's say you do this. Then, um, <clears throat> then you could look at the local uh, homology. Uh, so Hn of u, u minus, uh, u, so ui, ui, xi. So f will map this into Hn of v, v minus um, y. Right, because we know that f maps each xi to y. What does that say? Hn of ui comma ui minus okay. xi, and then v comma v minus y. All right. So these are the local homology groups, and we know that these are just c's. So we get a degree from seeing what this does to a generator. Right? So um, this map is given by 1 goes to, and we're going to call this the degree at xi. So it's the local degree. Okay, so what we want to show is that the degree is given by the sum of these local degrees. Okay, so we want to show. Degree of f is equal to the sum over all of the inverse images of this y of uh, the degree of xi. Yes? So the local degree can be viewed as sort of like the, um, sort of like the, the, the multiplicity of xi as a three image of y. Uh, well, so the multiplicity, uh, so not quite. It, it's more like. Um, um, the local degree is something that you can compute with linear algebra in, in practice. So it's, once you have a smooth map, then, then um, so if you have a smooth map, you can pick these. So the local degree is always going to be either plus or minus 1, just depending on whether or not f preserves the orientation at xi or reverses the orientation of xi. Uh, so each of these, be, it, so it yeah. Could be assigned to that's right. So, but it's just going to be preserve the orientation or not preserve the orientation. And that's why it's usually very easy to compute the local degree. So you just look at it, and you can compute the local degree if you can draw the, the map. Um, so, but in any case, we'll, we'll just take it as a given that this is simpler than this, so that this is a win. Um, in practice, it is. So OK, we want to show this. Uh, but instead of rushing through it in six minutes, we'll just do it next time.